So today we will continue <coughs> from here. Hmm? We stopped last time speaking about non-vocal sound. Hmm? And in particular, we were speaking about auditory icons. Hmm? Auditory icons that, that uses natural sounds to represent different kind of types of object or action in interactive system and application. Mm -hmm. So basically, auditory icons invented in er early 1980 for the Apple's Finder are caricatures of sounds that already happens in the real world in the natural world more specifically mm? and these kind of sounds are great for specifically one reason because we already knew them we already can associate a meaning to a natural sound because we heard that sound in our daily life let's say mm? the problem uh, for which we cannot only use auditory icons in interactive system is that not everything, not all actions, not, not all objects have a natural sound associated with a meaning. Hmm? So this is, can create problems if we want to add sound to some specific action or object. Hmm? But some, of, some sounds are natural that can be used. So, example of auditory icons. We, we mentioned at least one, I think, last time or two times ago. The trash bin. That it's uh, natural because it's the sound of a sheet of paper uh, throwing away. Um, Another, another example, if you if came to your mind. A danger like a siren that is um, making sound, making noise to, sign, to signal a, a warning, something that is not working. Yes, not really natural. Uh, I agree, but also paper is not really probably natural. But it, it's already it's sound that's in the real world that we can associate because we know the meaning. Uh, yes. And other sounds that came to my mind is um, so we can consider that I think auditory. Uh, auditory icons, even if it's partially artificial. Uh, another sound that we can, uh, so some email clients, when, I don't know now, but in the past for sure, when you send an email, they make a sound like a, an airplane that is leaving or something in the air that is moving very fast. So the sound of a hair moving with an object that uh, moves, move the hair around him very, very fast. Uh, so this is also something that is leaving very, very fast and moving the hair, like the email that is leaving your inbox. So also that could be considered. But you know, not a lot of, of sound as, not a lot of actions. So which is the sound for, uh, I don't know, uh, confirming an action or issue a warning, not a danger, a warning or uh, moving an icon, moving a folder from one place to another or receiving a message on WhatsApp or Telegram, which is the natural sound for those things. We, we, we don't have a natural sound for those things. And that's why in uh, a few years later, uh, Another person invented this hear con, hmm? uh, that is a pawn for the term high con, with the high representing the, the high sides. So hear con is for an icon for here, so hear con. And it uh, has 
differently from auditory icons, these are not natural sound. These are sound that were built appositely uh, for interactive system. Mm -hmm. And so they have no direct uh, natural relationship with the events or the information or the object for which they were related. Also speaking about auditory icons and other examples that came to my mind, uh, do you know Twitter? Twitter, the online social network, more or less. Uh, early in, in Twitter days, the, the application for Twitter, when you tweet something and you press the button tweet, you, uh, you heard a, a bird that was singing because it was tweeting, so you tweet something and the bird was tweeting. So that is also a natural sound, not to really be useful as, as a feedback, but at least you had the feedback that the tweet was sent and you heard that a bird that was tweeting in that moment. Uh, but here cones, here cones are not natural sound. So sounds that are not, um, that are built upon, hmm, built for deplication. Hmm. And ear cones um, have clearly no direct relationship with anything in the natural world, and we need to learn their meaning. We need to associate the sound that we hear with an action that is happening in an interactive system. Hmm. And ear cones are composed of motives, Typically, they are short, rhythmics, rhythmic sequence, and they can vary quality, register, and dynamics. And they are used mainly to add context, hmm? helping the user maintain awareness of what is happening. And uh, example, we, we mentioned that before, basically, but example here comes. The bell. What? No? Examples of ear cones. Do you have WhatsApp, Telegram, or any messaging system on your phone? If the sound that they emit when a message arrives is natural, is a natural sound, or is made on for that scope? Which one? Natural or made up? Not natural. Hmm? So that is an ear con, because it's a sound that we now recognize because when you heard uh, the, the typical sound, for instance, for WhatsApp, you know that it's a WhatsApp message, it is not a Telegram message, it is not a uh, SMS hmm? sound, but it's something different. Notification sounds. Hmm? Maybe some specific application use a specific sound for notification, and that is also something that, is, that we acquire. Hmm? We learn that sound, and that is an ear con. When you move a folder, for sure on, on a Mac, I don't remember on Windows, but when you move a folder from one place or a file from one place to another, there is a sound that is associated at the end of the operation. And that sound is not natural, clearly. It's made up, but we, so it, it serves as adding context and help the user maintain our awareness of what is happening. So even if you have the phone in your pocket, but you, you listen for a messaging, for a message arriving, because you hear the sound. And if you are not watching your screen, not seeing your screen, but you are, I don't know, moving files, a very big file in, in the background, but you are using your email or GitHub or whatever, um, and the file is moving background because it's five gigabyte, well, when the, that movement is complete, when the operation is complete, you hear a sound about the, the completion of the operation, even if you don't look. So it adds add context and help you to, to know if the operation is completed or not, briefly, hmm? clearly. So these are about sound. 
So we, we, we today, we still today use these two kind of auditory icons, let's use this term, the auditory icons, the earcon in our application, in our computer system. Even on smartphones, hmm, we still use uh, those two metaphors hmm, that have more than 40 years now hmm, because they were both born in the 80, so more than 40 years, more or less. Hmm. And these are the two categories for which all the sounds are created or used in an application, either mobile or desktop or web or whatever. Hmm. And, and these are clearly not vocal sound, hmm, because it, they are just sound that are from, from nature. What if, hmm, but since we are speaking about multimodality, what if we introduce voice and speech? What we can do hmm, with voice and speech? So first of all, which is the, the difference between voice and speech? Is there a difference? Are they the same thing? Yes, voice is, uh, I'm repeating for, for the registration, voice is the sound that we emit. Hmm? Um, also, I don't know, <clears throat> could be interpreted as voice or uh, any sound that we can emit with our mouth could be voice, because it's vocal. It's something that we can emit vocally. So also other kind of sound that are not languages hmm? could be his voice. Speech instead is structured and is what I'm doing now, I'm speaking. Hmm? So with a specific language, the sound emitted in a specific language have a meaning in that specific language. The same sound in another language has no, no, no sense or a very different sense, or in some cases also a similar sense, but it depends on the language. Hmm? But it can, can be everything, could be the same thing, could be totally different things, could be something that is totally unrelated. Hmm? So voice in general is, could be an efficient input modality. It can allow people to communicate, to give comments, and on our term, because we, we know how to speak and we know how to meet sound with, how to create voice. Hmm? Uh, speech instead, given that is language dependent, is more ambiguous than sounds that we can emit. And for a computer system, independently from what you can read uh, probably everywhere, Fully understanding human language is not a possibility currently. There is no system that fully understands any language from human. Fully, fully understand. Maybe partially, maybe pretty good, but not fully. Hmm? Uh, even between humans, sometimes a fully understanding of natural language is not totally achievable. Hmm? How many times you, you, you say to another person, no, wait. I was meaning that, hmm? because the first time the information wasn't conveyed and there was not a full understanding. Hmm? So this is even more complex for a computer system. Uh, but as we mentioned last time, um, we have hmm, nowadays voice and speech interaction on computers, on smartphones, on tablets, on other devices in the home like Google Assistant, like Alexa, et cetera. And they simulate a natural language interaction because you speak with this thing and this thing will reply to you. Hmm? Uh, but uh, how many of you use this kind of thing, especially not on a smartphone? Used at least twice, let's say. Okay, a few. Um, so, as maybe they know, mm -hmm. uh, these clearly use a restricted set of sentences that they understand, hopefully, sometimes, often. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, not always. You cannot speak anything. You cannot ask anything in any way. Because they are able to understand a specific set of commands. Quite complex, quite large, but, but yet specific set of commands. Hmm? Uh, and this is a problem for the user. Because the person that wants to use this system has to learn and remember. Hmm? So recall, recognition, recall that criteria there. With voice assistant, you need to, to learn what to say and how to say. Hmm? And there are some things that are probably uh, easier and more similar to what you are going to say anyway. And there are other things that said in a way work and said in another way, slightly different, doesn't. Hmm? Uh, so you, you have to learn how to interact with this system. And it's, it's not like graphical user interface where you have the icon, when you have the button, and you can click on it. And if there is no button, you cannot do that action. It's, it's easy. You don't see that, you cannot do the action. Hmm? Uh, these things are, I don't have a picture, but these things are uh, typically, some, someone has a screen also, but they are typically voice only and speech only. Hmm? So you, you don't know what you can do. They are there on the top of a table and waiting for you saying something. Hmm? And what you can say depends. Um, so in your experience, happen something sometimes happened that you said something and the assistant did, uh, didn't understand or did something totally different. Yes. Well. Uh, because there is, you know, a, a two kind of problem. One, you have to learn how to say, and then there is the, the environment. There is noise in the environment. There are other people in the environment. There is issues with connectivity. There are, could be a, a lot of things that can go wrong in that kind of interaction that is vocal interaction. Hmm? Um, but even those very complex things, from a computer perspective, voice-based interaction is mainly two steps. Really, just two steps. Then there could be some, let's say, intelligence in the middle, but there are two main steps. The process for bringing speech to text and the opposite. So what they, how those kind of things work, like Alexa, etc. They get your speech, they translate it, they write in text, and they elaborate the text. And then when they have the, the response, they did the same, at the opposite. They get the text and they pronounce the text. Hmm? Clearly, in the between, there is the difference between these devices that try to understand, maybe have some follow-up question, or maybe have a list of things to do, or provide answer, or query for the waiter to an external service, etc. So there is other things that happens in between. But not all voice-based interaction is uh, Alexa or Google Home or whatever. Hmm? There are voice-based interaction that leverage one or both of these without even the natural language understanding part that those services have, hmm? because they understand the natural language. They try to understand, to give a meaning to that sound, to that words. Hmm? That, they understand, that they transcribe. And I think that you probably at least one example of uh, speech synthesis, you, you have used at least one in, once in your life. Which online service give you text-to-speech? Google? Yes, Google Translate, for instance. Google Translate, if you go on Google Translate, 
So I can also open this other one. Um, Google Translate. Uh, well, well, you can speak also, actually, but um, I don't know. Uh, you can also press here and listen the, the word or the sentence that is translated in the language for which it's translated. And this is speech to text, text to speech, sorry. Because it tried to uh, translate, to, to speak about that word. And this is just the end of this process, not both. Uh, another example, slightly more complex uh, is, for instance, this thing here that I, I will not be able to, to use now uh, because, yeah, exactly, because of the many, um, okay, because of probably the, main, the, now, the noise or the, um, or the microphone in the room. But basically, this is a text editor in which you can speak, we can try, in which you can speak and it will try to write what you say, mostly. So if you have a good microphone, uh, for sure you, you can. You can use it uh, in a room with a microphone that is like this moving around, low, low volume actually also, um, it, can takes, uh, it can take a bit and it cannot maybe work very well. But this is speech to text. It's just getting my speech and translate, transcribe in text. And this is just not, and this is just not to type, but like Google Home or Alexa, it has a series of commands to do other things, like let's put this word in bold, or let's create a new line, or let's create a, a, a stop, a point, let's put a point, a comma, hmm? punctuation. Hmm? All these other things that you, you don't speak you don't say new line when you speak with another person. New paragraph, hmm? capital letter. You just speak. Hmm? So this uh, software that, as you see, is totally web-based, uh, both understand your, uh, transcribe your speech, but also has a set of commands to do all these other actions. And which are these commands? Do you know how to say to this thing, new paragraph or new line? Probably not. Uh, and, and, and there is, I hope, somewhere. Nope. Uh, um, there were, somewhere, uh, uh, an a instruction hmm? on the home page. Yes, clearly. And to insert a new paragraph, you can either say new paragraph, insert sentence, add new para, add paragraph, new line, but not insert paragraph. Because it's not here, it's not there. So you have to learn what I was saying before. You have to learn what to say. Hmm? Because if you say new paragraph, new line, add paragraph, it works. It adds a new paragraph. It adds a new line. But if you say insert paragraph, is not there, is not in that set of commands. Hmm? So voice interface, voice interaction are really powerful on the surface because we can just speak. We don't have to learn, we don't have to see, we don't have to learn that this, this is a button, this is a link, etc. but we have to learn what to say hmm? because this device, this software nowadays is constricted is not fully uh, open, is not fully, not, doesn't understand everything that they can say. 
but it's just as a set of commands. And in this case, more or less, you have sort of limited set of instruction. You are just typing. So you have to create a new paragraph, maybe make something bold, uh, maybe delete the text, copy text and clipboard. You have a set of commands, not infinite. But the action, the possible action, are not so much. Uh, clearly, if you, and this is just for typing text, but if you have something more complex, like again, Alexa, Google Assistant, you have to learn all of these for multiple uh, contexts, not only for typing, like in this case, but also for the weather, and also for the TV program, and also for recipes, and also for appointments, meetings, and buying things, and to the list, and etc. So really, there is, for each of these contexts, for each of these domain, there is something new that the, that the user has to learn and remember. Mm? Because there is no visual cue. Mm? There is no uh, suggestion from the device. Mm? Because the device is there, just a speaker on a table. Maybe it has a light on it to, get, to say I'm listening or not, but there is no real feedback hmm? or suggestion or help or support to the user. Hmm? So again, hmm? these are speech to text, text to speech, the main foundation of all these elements. Sometimes they are used together, sometimes one or the other, sometimes with a step of natural language processing, but you still have to learn what to say, because you cannot say everything. And the other things needs to understand what you want to say and do the right action at the right moment that is not trivial as the user of these, those of you that use those devices know. Hmm? Uh, so, to summarize, clear advantages, you have just to speak. Clear disadvantages, you have to, to know what to say. And the environment should be good enough for, um, for that kind of interaction. If it's a really noisy environment and the speaker is put in the middle of a room, you, it's, it's almost impossible that you can trigger the device and receive the commands. Because voice is, is in the space in which we are. Hmm? So it's, it's more complex to trigger than not just typing something, compressing something on a keyboard. And there is another, let's say, problem linked to voice interface, especially for Google Home uh, or, or that kind of smart speaker. Did it come to your mind? What could be? It's not a technical issue, it's more it is partially linked to what I said about you have to learn what to say. The language. No, you, let's imagine that you are speaking Italian. Those things are totally speaking Italian very well. Um, it's not a Again, it's not a technical issue like recognition or language. It's something more human, let's say. Yeah, that, again, again is it, yes, hesitation to speech uh, actually is more a technical limitation of this kind of thing, which, for which if you stop speaking because you hesitate or you change your mind, you want to change a word, too late. You have to restart from scratch. Yeah, that is, this is another kind of issue that is more technological, let's say. It could be solved, probably. When don't you address the machine but somebody else? Yeah, typically, that could, that could, that could be, but typically those devices have a wake word 
Mm, that is the, the war that wakes them up. And so you can say, you have to say Alexa to, to interact with this. So you have to say Alexa stop. You cannot say stop. Um, so if you set a timer and then you want to stop the timer before the timer is, is done, you have to say wake word plus stop, let's say, or stop the timer, or cancel the timer, etc. So there is the wake word. That is the other problem, right? If you have this uh, near to a television, it will trigger every advertisement of the uh, uh, Alexa or, or a radio also. If, if somebody says, Alexa, this will be triggered. Mm? Uh, if you put, uh, so the wake words are somewhat personalizable, and if you put the wake word like computer, then every time you say computer, or everybody in the room is a computer, or uh, TV advertisements say computer, that's being with start doing something. Um, so that is another, clearly another kind of problem. Uh, because there is no, uh, there is not a strong um, a recognition of the speaker. Hmm? There is recognition of the speech, but not who is speaking for those kind of systems. There is something, but it's not really still 100% uh, precise. Yes, the distance, because if you are too far, clearly you cannot, cannot listen. The accent is surely a problem of who is speaking. Yes. Not only um, a foreign person speaking another language, but also if you look, if you look there are some videos of Alexa that in English, in British English that doesn't understand the Scottish accent uh, that is still British English, but it's a Scottish accent, so it has trouble understanding that language, that accent, yes. Especially for, 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 for languages like English, uh, yes. That could be. There is also an increasing possibility for frustration. Uh, because those things speak and listen. And so when we interact with those things, at the beginning at least, when you bring that at home, they're brand new, uh, it seems to you automatically you behave like you were speaking with another person. Hmm? So you, you start speaking because they are voice-based, you speak. Um, and this creates frustration because they cannot understand everything. Hmm? So there is this assumption, not this assumption, this issue, that when this technology is introduced, hmm, people behave like they were totally capable of understanding speech like a norm, uh, another person, but they are not. So the assumption is too high by default for these devices. And then they discover that clearly they cannot say everything and that they will need to repeat the same thing three times before getting possibly uh, the right answer. They, they learn after time, but at the beginning the assumption is, oh, I can speak. I will say anything, and that thing will reply to me like another person. This is the assumption that we, we would say everybody has when takes one of these things at home or try one of these things for the first time without being exposed to this thing before. Just speaking like an, another person. Because they are voice based, you can speak with them and they will answer. So play music and you will have music in theory. Hmm? So this is create much more frustration because the assumption that we have for this thing is that they are like a human, except they are not. Hmm? And so this creates much more frustration than the graphical user interface for which is clear what you can do and what you cannot because you see in front of you the elements. Hmm? Here, this invisibility plus the fact that we speak with other person to communicate normally every day, hmm, in a, let's say, typically developed person, create this additional sense of frustration, sense of difficulties. Hmm. And designer of this 
kind of system should be able, hmm, since day one, to inform the user that they, those things are not person, hmm? not really uh, human beings, but they are something different. Hmm? And so they have, for instance, some strategies. So when you buy um, uh, an Amazon Hiko, you are, I think, automatically subscribed to a sort of newsletter that sends you periodically hmm, some new sentences that you can say and not say. So there is this learning. Hmm? But there's also this creation of this expectation. Because you receive every week, oh, did you try to say that? Hmm? Why not? Hmm? Etc. So this is another thing to, to consider, especially for those most complex hmm, uh, systems, in which there is speech-to-text, natural language processing or understanding, and text-to-speech. So there is the, the entire process, from the speech that the human is saying to the, the speech that the human is hearing back. Uh, well, the, these slides just highlight some opportunities for designers, for creators, around voice-based interaction. Hmm? Not, only in gen not only specifically for, let's say, the more advanced, like the, again, Alexa, Google Assistant, etc., cetera, um, but also mo more in general for all kind the voice-based interaction. So even the, the simpler one, like Google Translate, so clearly, spoken interaction is successful in many cases. When you want to learn a new, a new word on the vocabulary, you can tap the word on Google Translate and hear the pronunciation. Hmm? Uh, and if you click twice, the second time you click, you hear the same word slower, hmm? a little bit slower, so that you can more appreciate the, the pronunciation. But also, when users have physical impairments, also temporary, and this is, again, designing with diversity. If you cannot use a rand, you can type, you cannot click on a screen, you can speak. So that is uh, an advantage, something that you can, can use more. I cannot type on Word, but I can speak on this uh, dictation.io, the website that I've shown before. So I can produce text. Maybe not perfect, maybe not good enough like for words, but I can. I can communicate, I can work, I can have fun time if I'm uh, writing for fun. Mm -hmm. uh, but also when the speaker ends are busy, when mobility is required, when the highs are occupied. Mm -hmm. So many cars now have some sort of speech to text to command, not even, not the, the most complex one. But you press a button and you can say, call this person. Or put the climate control to 22 degrees. Very simple action, hmm? very a limited set of commands. But this is good in a car. Because you, are, you should be, if you are the driver, you should be focused on the street, watching the street and the, the dashboard and moving the, the steering wheel, etc pressing the pedals, and not interacting with the graphical user interface uh, next to you mm -hmm. to increase the temperature or call somebody. Mm -hmm. um, but they are also useful, very, very useful, for application domain in which the vocabulary and the task is limited. So when you have to learn very few commands to use this thing. Mm -hmm. Three, four, five. There is not a lot of learning. Hmm? So, like dictation. Dictation, just one task. Write text. And then if you want to do something more, you have a set of commands that is limited. To add a new line, uh, copy and paste, this is already advanced probably, as a command, etc. Hmm? And when, clearly, when the, the person is unable to read or write, hmm? having a speech interface, in which you speak or this interface speak is good if you are, cannot re read hmm? because you can uh, clearly benefit from the content and from the information. And it has some obstacle 
we, we already listened, uh, listed uh, some of them. So interference from noise environment or poor quality microphone or too low volume. Uh, commands that need to be learned and remembered. Hmm? Uh, accent or unusual vocabulary or when talking is not acceptable hmm? during a meeting or for privacy issues. You, you can do a lot of things with, again, Alexa or Google Assistant, but you cannot uh, insert a password vocally, for instance. Clearly, you are not going to say vocally out loud the password, but you have to reach out to your, your phone that is connected to the system and insert there the password in a more private way. Hmm? Uh, error connect correction is terrible, especially with this more advanced system. You don't do error correction. You make an error, you start the sentence again. Hmm? You cannot say, um, like we, we can say in uh, that we are speaking about voice-based interaction, advantages, no obstacles. Or not obstacles, advant not advantages, obstacles. You cannot correct yourself. Hmm? When we can speaking, we can say, no, I, I meant something different. Just forget the last sentence. Or turn on the light, not the lamp. It's something that we do. And everybody understand what we mean. So if I say, please turn on the light, or no, sorry, that lamp here. Everybody go to, possibly, to the lamp over there and not to the, the first light. Because there is, is, oh no, that lamp. Hmm? And this is not currently possible with these interfaces. Hmm? There is no error correction. Uh, clearly, there is an increased cognitive load compared to typing, pointing, or using a touch screen because you have to remember what to say and especially you have to remember what this thing is saying. Hmm? So, uh, well, maybe on the phone work the same thing, but if you ask what, what's on TV tonight, it will start with a long list of every channel. Hmm? So on Rai Uno there is this. And on right away, there is this other thing, uh, et cetera. And at the end of the tenth element, you have to remember if you were interested to the third one. And it's, you don't have cues around you. It's only vocal, so you have to remember. You cannot see a summary. You cannot see a list. You have to remember everything. Hmm? So there is a, a cognitive load, not only for knowing what to say, but also for remembering if the list of information is long. Imagine to have a recipe in which this thing is speaking to you a recipe. Okay, and the previous step was you have to remember everything. Hmm? And clearly some operation, how do you insert mathematical formula vocally? Are really difficult or need extreme customization or personalization. Like, oh, if I say this, then open a parenthesis of this kind. Hmm? Um, the output, if I need to see what, what's in TV in five channels, on a visual display, I will probably see the five channels with the, an image and the title of the movies or whatever it is. Here, I have to wait the pronunciation of all five channels before having this information. So I need more time to complete the operation. So all of these are obstacles. Um, so advantages and disadvantages as many things. And, and most of the obstacles are not, some of are technical, others are clearly more uh, related to the nature of speech and voice. And how works a voice-based interaction in case you, you need to, to design uh, one of them? Well, typically there is a phase that is the initiation. 
Mm? So in dictation.io, I press the button start. With uh, Alexa, you say the wake word. Mm? And then, clearly, you have to know what to say, and learnability is this main issues. Then there are recognition error, and they will happen. Hmm? Again, accent, et cetera. Here, there is an example. Dime and time, they have very similar sound in English, but they mean totally different things. Hmm? If in Italian, we say Roma e Toma, for instance. Similar sound, different meaning. Hmm? You don't eat Roma, maybe you eat Toma. And then there is error correction. So first one is recognizing the error. You say something, you don't see the output, you don't listen for the output that you expect or the action that you expect, and then you have to recognize that there was an error. Or maybe you're lucky, there was an error, but everything worked well. Because it's what, this wasn't the, the most important word in which the error was, and so it works anyway. Hmm? So let's make an example. Turn on the light, let's make there is an error on D. It's not a problem, turn on light. Probably the sentence is still understandable. Hmm? Uh, but when we recognize that there is an error, there is the correction of the error, and we say it's not possible right now, we have to repeat the sentence. Uh, or hmm, if the assistant, let's say again, Alexa asked for some details that wasn't uh, got in the, in the first place, we can answer. Mm -hmm. So let's imagine again, set the timer for five minutes, and let's imagine that there is an error in five minutes, this kind of thing could ask for how many time? And you can say five minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, then there is the mapping to possible action. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the most complex part for designing a voice based interaction. So mapping the words, the sentence, to the right outcome of the sentence. Hmm? Considering errors that may happen in the sentence. Again, turn on the light. There is an error on the D. Hmm? I have to probably be able to pick all the rest of the sentence. Turn on light, turn on is a verb. Light is a specific light in the room. And the light can be turned on, yes. So. I can do the action, uh, fire the, the light, probably not, hmm? or turn on the light, but I have three lights here, three lamps here, so which one? Hmm? I have to proceed with the possible action, which is the possible action. I will turn on everything, I will turn on one random lamp in the room, I will ask which light. These are designing decision hmm, that one has to take when designing a voice-based interaction. And then as a result of the possible, of mapping of the possible action, there is feedback and dialogue. Hmm. So which light or done or a sound that, that means done. Hmm. So these are the step, the first four basically are the one that happens also if you use these kind of devices, but all the six are things to consider when designing a voice-based interaction. Hmm? Either of an entire application or as a part of a specific application or a graphical application, hmm? like Google Translate that is totally graphical but has um, um, a button for the speech to text, the text to speech. Or if you imagine uh, also some application or some prototypes that you were de developing, maybe some part could be done or could be done easier with a speech interface. Hmm? Uh, so for instance, for a to-do list, maybe inserting the to-do list vocally, the things to, to buy, the, the group that is doing the uh, organization in the, in the house. I, I don't know if, you, if they are here. But that thing, that part could be done by typing. Oh, let's buy these. Or just speaking. Pressing a button on the microphone and saying 
vegetables. Hmm? Probably it's also easier in movement if you are a supermarket, if you are some, somewhere, or oh, you have to write that, but I can press a button and say vegetables. Hmm? So not only for cr creating completely different user interface, but also for augmenting specific um, part of graphical user interface. And related to this, uh, specifically to the speech to text part, uh, we also have these screen readers. Hmm? We already mentioned at least tr three times, I think, four times. Um, like this software for uh, handling vocal synthesis, so speech to text to speech, uh, and or the braille display that we have seen a few lessons ago. Uh, and this screen reader software that you have to install on your computer or you already have on your computer and on mobile and can be used by people who are blind or with severe visual impairments and how they work, they proceed one element after the other in a grid-based disposition of the screen. So starting from here, they pick the first element here, if there is an element here, and then move to the other, oops, and then move to the other, and then move to the other, and at the end of the line, they go in the new element on the other page. So for instance, here, a screen reader will get this, I would say, hopefully, dictation I.O., and then it will pick demo, help, English, title English, common commands, the following table list commands that you can blah, blah. So it reads everything of the page from the top corner on the, on the left to the bottom corner on the right until the person who is using that stop the reading or press something. So let's say that I want to click this button. Hmm? So this thing will start the reading dictation I.O. Demo, help, and I will press something to trigger the click on help. Hmm? And if I didn't do anything, it will continue. And if I need to tap on this, on click on voice detection on the button, I will need to wait until I will reach this position on the screen. Sequentially, line per line, cell per cell, if you imagine this as a grid. Hmm? So I, I was saying that there were uh, screen readers, that, uh, there is voiceover on Mac OS and iOS, there is TalkBack already installed on Android, you can enable it if you want to, to test it. And then here there are some other famous screen reader. Um, and there is also this demo that I don't know if I'm able to show you because of the sound of this. Just to show you, no. Advertisement. Just to give you an idea how uh, No. Okay. Uh, but if you um, so I I show you how it works, you see, it highlights one portion of the page at a time, and when you want to click on the link, you just press something on, on the keyboard. And notice this here, you, you have to listen to, to, to understand better this, but the, that percentage here. So notice also this. This say, this is a link and the text in the link is search UCSF. At a certain point, there is navigation item one that clearly is useless for a person that cannot see. Because what is navigation items one? What is link search UCSF? It's a link for doing what? Searching UCSF. What is navigation item one? Who knows? 
So that part of the web page is not accessible because it's not readable hmm, by a screen reader. And uh, here, this system can have a rate, a speed. Hmm? And if you listen to this video, just a portion of this video at the beginning, because then this person uh, decrease the speed of the, the speech, uh, they will use, they use screen reader be, with an incredibly high speed. Hmm? It, you, you don't understand anything when, this, when it's using this. Because they, they have to read the entire page. So if you read the page slowly, they will need one hour to read a, a long page. So they are used to have this system extremely fast. And they understand everything. And now in this video, you, at the beginning you see, you, you listen how, how fast it goes, and then it decreases just to allow everybody else watching the video to understand hmm, how it works. Because at the beginning it's just uh, noise, sound, all the word put together, without space, without anything, really, really fast. Hmm? But they are used to this kind of speed. And they use typically, not just this person, but a lot of persons who are blind listen, use screen reader, speak based, speech based with this velocity, with this speed. Hmm? That is extremely fast. So uh, I cannot show you here because it doesn't play, but uh, listen just the first 10 seconds. Hmm? So here there are 40 seconds less than this because here is already decreasing the speed just to, to have an idea of how fast they use this kind of thing. And also this, is, this should remind you that clearly this is a good example of, um, again, designing for somebody that is not you. Because you will never use a, a screen reader with that speed. Because at least I can speak for, for me, I don't understand anything in that speed, with that speed. Anything, not even one word. But a lot of persons who are blind are really used to that speed and use that or maybe also even faster and can use it, can actually use and interact with any application in this way. So if I was designing that things for me, I would probably go two pair, three times faster, maybe not more than three times faster. They maybe can go 10 times faster than normal, let's say, the normal cadence of a language speaking. Mm -hmm. So if you want, this is the second video on the slide, this one here, the screen reader demo, just the first 20 or 30 seconds, no need to, to listen for, for, a, for a lot more. Okay. So this closes the multimodal uh, interaction series of lectures. Any question? Yes. Good question. Uh, so the question was, uh, the screen reader, uh, so the question started with the assumption. The screen reader recognized the elements on a web page uh, and tried to recognize the same elements on a desktop application or a mobile application when this uh, semantic is not evident like in a HTML page in which you know that there is a link because you have the, a specific tag for the link. Um, there is also the option, the question was, for screen readers, uh, to select what to, to say first. So first all the buttons, or first all the links, or first all the images, or first all the titles, etc. Uh, this was the question. The answer is, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so the normal way of proceeding of a screen reader is sequential. Um, 
there are other ways of proceeding for a screen reader. Uh, I don't know if there is an option for selecting things, like in this way, okay, I, I'm interested in all the buttons. Uh, maybe yes, but it's an advanced option for a screen reader. Uh, I would say that is probably difficult, but just my, my opinion, it's difficult to proceed in that way if you don't have any idea. Okay, the first time that you're visiting a website, you don't have any idea where the information is if you cannot look at the page. So if you, don't, if you don't know if there is a button or if there is a link or there is somewhere else, or if there is this information, or in a menu and then there is another link in the menu, you don't know. So for sure the first time you need to, to go through the page, the entire page, until you find. Then maybe the second run, if you are still interested in pressing that button, that kind of option could be useful. It's, it's technically possible, clearly, to select all the buttons on a page, but the point is, is for which I, I don't have an answer, is, is it useful for a person who is blind? Uh huh. Yeah, if you are maybe uh, usual, you, you usually go to that page, could be a shortcut for, um, for, for navigating the, the page. Um, but most of the uh, accessibility tool use this grid-based schema hmm, for which you have this big grid and you start from one element and go sequentially. And this is also limiting uh, not only for web page, not only for time, but also for the possibility you can have. So think about writing. You have a keyboard on screen, and you want to press the letter M. That is the last letter on the last row. You have every time to wait until you reach the M. All right, because it's the Q, W, E, R, T, et cetera, and then you reach the the M, that's the very last letter on the keyboard. Hmm? Because it starts from the beginning. So for keyboards, they solve it changing the keyboard's layout or suggesting which is the most probable letter. So if you select A, you will have one step after the three letters that in your language came after the E, the A. Hmm? I don't know, whatever, B. Let's say, I don't know. And then if you don't want, you can ignore it and proceed, but there is shortcuts, for instance, but it's, it's in the structure of the, of the keyboard. So for keyboards, let's say easier, they change the structure. Think about video games. Pick an um, alien shooter, the one that aliens fall from the screen, from the top of the screen and you have to shoot to the alien, if you, you have a system, so you have all these alien, where is here, falling down, different speed, different moments, and you have something here that you have to, to move and maybe click on the shoot to the alien. And if this thing is reading from the top corner, and maybe you have to select the alien, not having something here to shoot. You have to select the alien to, to kill the alien. And if this thing starts always from here, you, you are making a very difficult game because the problem are the aliens that are here at this level, not this one. And if you change the rule and start from the bottom, you're making the game too easy because you're already selecting the, the alien on the bottom. So you're always winning because the first thing that you select is the one that you want to, to eliminate from the screen. 
So also in that case, there are other options that came up with research, for instance, for games and disability. Hmm? About multimodality, about uh, not using a grid base by using some more, I don't know, time-related, uh, so attaching to each of these alien a clock. And when the handles of the clock are at noon, you can kill it. And so when you press something, you kill the, the elements that have this clock at noon. But you have to see the clocks clearly. It cannot work very well for people who are just listening. Hmm? But it works well for people that cannot use a keyboard and a mouse that are other users that use this kind of grid-based uh, system hmm, for interacting with an application. And instead, it worked perfectly with a chess the game, because you have a square. It's already a square. You have your elements on the top, on the bottom, two players, and each one will see the element. And it's a slow-paced game. You don't, you don't have in a hurry. You can also take five minutes to move um, the queen from one position to the other. So uh, the, the accessibility world is challenging, I would say, for, for the possibility that, the, for the input modality and the output mobility that we have on computer system nowadays. Close parenthesis. Any other question? Okay, I, uh, I'm not going to start speaking about uh, the next topic because it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes before the end of the class. Mm -hmm. But just to say, the next topic would be this one and we will start next week to have a um, conversation. And we will start, not next week, next lecture to have a conversation on what change when we interact with an AI system like Alexa or like Google Home, what's different between that and a traditional graphical user interface. Hmm? But next Thursday. Um, in this, let's say 15 minutes that are left, um, don't you have any question, I don't know, about the exam, about anything else? You are super prepared and you already know what to expect up to the end of the course and even after. What kind of question can you can have about this part or in general? about this part or in general. About this part, uh, multimodal, a uh, question for the written exam, because it's the only place when we, we are going to have a question, is tell me the difference between auditory icons and earcon. Exemplify one type of auditory icon. Explain what is an auditory icon with three examples. List the advantages or disadvantages of voice-based interaction. Um, things like that about the multimodal. Then there are a lot of slides in multimodal. Uh, define multimodal interaction hmm? and provide one example of a multimodal interface. Question like this. But I hope you know, but on the website there is this tab here, it's called the Incredibly Exam, uh, where on the bottom, you have a few exams with solutions. Hmm? Uh, so we, so starting from the first, um, so this course started in 2019, so we don't have exams before 2019 because there is no course. So the first was that sample exam question that are just question for the exam. And the program changed a bit since 2019 and today. Uh, but not incredibly. Um, so some question can, cannot be more valid, any more valid from these exams here. Um, because 
in the last two years, we gave to the projects a restriction that this year we removed. So in 2019, we dedicated uh, some lectures and exercises on voice-based inter interfaces because all the project had to implement a voice-based interaction in the prototype. So a portion of the prototype should work vocally and provide the results on speech. So that was a requirement for our project in 2019. Last year, uh, all the project had to implement some, all projects should work on a smartphone or were designed for a smartphone or tablet and should use a sensor of a smartphone, camera, microphone, uh, GPS, accelerometer, to do something that was useful for the prototype. Hmm? So we dedicated a bit of time giving some example uh, how to use smartphone sensor on the web. Hmm? And, for, and 2019, how to use voice-based interaction on the web. Hmm? So speak to text, text to text-to-speech. And then this year we removed this requirement. But clearly also lectures change a bit because in the first year we dedicated, I don't know, three, four, dot five hours to speech, to, to technically see how to create a, a voice-based interface. Very simple, like a chat bot, like a chat actually. Like tell me the weather and the answer was the weather is. Very simple. Tell me the weather in a day, in a place. And the answer was, it will be sunny in theory in today. Hmm? Uh, linked to a real weather forecast service. So this was three, four hours of lectures dedicated to that. But we, had, uh, we didn't have the uh, designing for diversity part. We didn't have the interacting with AI part because we had a lot more about voice interfaces, Alexa, et cetera. So maybe there are some questions here that were related to, to that. Mm. Last year, we didn't have this part about voice. Uh, we didn't do a, a lot of things about sensor because it, it's quite simple. So we just have some examples about sensor, but the uh, interacting with the AI part is slightly different this year from last year. Everything else should be really close to last year. Mm. But this, just to say, there were differences. So these are samples for the written exam. So the exam is typically, not typically, let's take, so we, as you see here, we did an exam simulation in 2020, in 20, each year. Hmm? So this was the first year, and we had an exam simulation on the last week of the course. This was last year, and we had an exam simulation. And this year, we are going to have an exam simulation on the last week of the course as well that we will put here. So we'll have one hour and a half in which we simulate an exam. We will give you a text of an exam, you can try to do the exam, and we will show you the result, the so a possible solution for the exam. Hmm? But all the exams, that is this one. There is already a date. Um, I, I wrote it, but I forgot it. It's the 13th of January. This should be the very last day of the classes, of our class, we are going to do an exam simulation. And the exam is, how can I remove this thing here? Okay. The exam, it's one hour. No book, no notes, no anything. Four questions. One of those is typically, meaning that up to now it always has been, an exercise. Hmm? So three questions that are theory, and one question that asks you to do something. Hmm? So for instance here, the question was, in usability testing, describe the importance of clearly defining the task that participants need to accomplish. 10 lines, five to 10 lines of description. And we didn't do usability testing yet, so you are allowed not to know the answer for this. 
and also this control experiment we didn't do yet. During the need finding phase, and this is something that you should know, during the need finding phase, discuss, discuss why open-ended questions are preferable to other kind of questions. What benefits they bring, what mistakes they avoid. So open-ended questions are preferable with respect to because they have these benefits, A, B, C, D, and these, uh, they, have these, uh, they avoid this mistake, A, B, C, D. That is the, the kind of answer to this question. Mm? It's not defining what is net finding, it's not defining what is interviews, it's not defining things. Answer to the question. Mm? So this was the exam simulation of last year, and there is some solution as well. And then there is, for instance, uh, we didn't publish all the, the exams, but for instance, there is the, ex the first exam of last year. Mm -hmm. uh, in which it was considered, the so the exercise, considering the following fragment of a web page containing a step in the enrollment to this university by a foreign student. Report and discuss the main violation, at least four. You have to find at least four violations of the heuristics. Hmm? Here, so right, this page uh, violates heuristic number one, two, three, four, whatever. Why? Because, etc. And in this case, hmm, we give you also the heuristics. Hmm? And clearly in this exam, there is not a question that say, please list the heuristics, because it will be too easy. So this is one exercise. Um, list the questionnaire that frequent, that, no, you, we didn't do usability testing. In which case a low fidelity prototype is preferable to a high fidelity prototype? So advantages, comparison between low fidelity, paper prototype versus uh, the final prototype, hmm? which is the advantages which when is preferable the first one to the second. Not describing the second one, not describing all kind of prototype, just saying why the first one is preferable to the second one. Again, five, 10 lines of text written in a way that is understandable in English. But understandable as way of writing and writing. So here you have the exams and some possible solution for the exams. For a few mm, texts. Uh, let's take, oh, okay. This one, for instance, is another kind of exercise. We didn't do that yet. Mm, this is the chi-square test. And we are going to do uh, in controlled experiment. Mm. So consider to identical version of web page that differs for the following button. Sign up, learn more. Mm, so in that page, one, the one version of the page has everything and the button that says sign up. And another version of the page is identical, but instead of having a button that says sign up, say learn more. And after conducting uh, online A-B testing, uh, where each visitor was randomly show one or the other page, hmm? so 100 people look at the sign up version of the page and uh, a little bit more to the learn more version of the page and split in this way 20 people sign up with the sign up button 80 didn't and in the other page in the other version more a little bit more people sign up than don't uh, it asks you run the k square test hmm? that again we didn't do it again yet uh, and report whether the change of the button had an impact on the sign-up rate. So NB testing is useful for understanding whether it's better one version of the page or another. In this case, one version of the button or the other. And so that the designer can say, okay, yes, if I put learn more, I will have more engagement on the website. So I will use learn more or vice versa. No, sign up. Hmm? So this is a test to uh, check, statistically check whether there is a significant difference, statistically significant difference between the two buttons, the two versions. And so which one is better, let's say, to use? 
This is another kind of, of exercise. We are going to do an exercise like this in class, not with these two buttons, clearly, and not with this number. Uh, define what a storyboard is, how it can be realized, its benefit and drawbacks. drawbacks. Hmm? So a storyboard is, it can be realized in this way, the benefits are one to three, and the drawbacks are one to three, four, five, a few. Again, 10. Describe what is heuristic evaluation, and now you would conduct it with multiple evaluators testing a single web page. You almost did it. List the, okay, this one is something that we don't have. List the categories in which contemporary voice user interface can be divided with a major advantage or disadvantage for each one. This was from the year in which we dedicated a big part, some hours, to voice user interface. So there are different categories in which voice user interface can be split, and this we're asking which are these categories. It's like uh, list the categories in which non-vocal sound in user interface can be divided. And you can say auditory icons and ear cones, and an advantage for both, and a disadvantage for both. Hmm? So these are the kind of, of question that you, you can find, and these exams are are here since day one of the course. Hmm? And we will add clearly uh, the exam simulation when we are going to, to do it with the solution, with a possible solution. Hmm? Okay? And here, you will also find hmm, the date of the written exam, that is the date that is on the Portale della Didattica, and the date that will not be contact the teacher but there will be a real date for the project evaluation. Hmm? But again, you will find also for this a, a module on the Portale della Didattica for enrolling. So you need to enroll separately to the exam and to, to the written exam and to the project evaluation. That will happen in two different days for each exam session, for each exam round, not session, for each exams. So every written test will have a project evaluation associated in another day, in another place also. Okay, any other one minute question? Yeah. When the project will be, when you have to deliver the project to us? together with the milestone four, seven days before the, your oral exam. So if, you, if your group is going to have the oral exam in September, seven day, day before the date in September. If you're going to have the oral exam in the first seat, seven day, seven day before the date. Milestone four and the code of the prototype. Milestone 4 in a M4 folder in your repository, as always, and the code of the prototype in the other repository that you have, the one that ends with code. You have two repositories. One is called the name of your project, and the other one is the name of your project minus code. The codes go in the one that has code in the name. No, we don't have the dates yet of the, of the oral exam because we need to, to decide that. We, we need to decide that and communicate to, to Politecnico. The other dates arrive from Politecnico and we can, we can say yes or yes. We have no choice. Um, but for this one, we can decide a date for which we don't have other exams and maybe you don't have other mandatory exam uh, of, that, uh, of, that, uh, of the year. And then it will be, uh, depending on how many groups we have, we, we will have 10 groups in that uh, oral evaluation. So it will go all day long. Or So it, if one of exams in the morning can, go, can come in the afternoon or vice versa, so it, it will be manageable. Quickly. Okay, right. 
it's, it's written in the introduction to the course slide. Brief introduction to the project, demonstration of the implementation, answering some question. <laughs> 10, 15 minutes per group, more or less. It depends how many groups we have in that session, in that moment also, a bit, <laughs> okay? Okay, we are not out of time, but mostly. Um, see you on Thursday, and if you have any question, as always, write or ask. <laughs>